Hello and welcome everybody. I appreciate it um, that you're coming, coming out for this talk here. Uh, given that there are other great talks happening at the same time, really happy to see all of you. So um, yeah, welcome to Visualizing Network Traffic of Bosch Releases. Uh, subtitle uh, here is where I'm promising intuition engineering for everyone. Um, a few words about myself. Hi, I'm Marco, uh, for all of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm a developer at SAP, and uh, I'm the PM of the Bosch OpenStack CPI there. I'm working with Bosch and CF since uh, sometime in 2014, so getting some, some good exposure about the whole topic. And um, my, my nick is uh, Feldsmo pretty much everywhere, so on GitHub and Twitter, uh, Cloud Foundry Slack, if you're trying to reach out after the talk, please do. Uh, let's start with the boring stuff. Here's a disclaimer. What you're about to see, so this is in the SAP track, but this is not the product. Right? Uh, this happened in my 10% time at SAP, where we get to play around and tinker with pretty much everything that we think is a good idea or we want to try out. And um, all of this is open source. I have the links in the presentation afterwards. You can try it out, but please use at your own risk. Um, right. Now that the mood is at its peak, um, let's talk about intuition engineering. So uh, who of you has heard the term before? Not an awful lot of people, great. So um, I heard that term first in, when I encountered a Netflix blog post in 2015, and I felt like uh, this term like, um, catch my attention because I felt like intuition and engineering Aren't those like antonyms? Is, is this supposed to go together? I, like, we, we proud ourselves to be engineers, right? We are, we are measuring stuff. We are based on facts and figures. We don't rely on our gut feeling or an intuition. This is what we are proud of. So um, typically, that means our uh, workplace looks similar to this, right? We got graphs. We got measurements. We got stuff going on because this is what we used to to, to analyze things. And um, all of this is great, right? We, we need all of this, but I think we often make the mistake thinking that, that this is the whole truth. This is all we need. This is what we need to, to, to understand things. And intuition engineering starts from there and um, has a few simple ideas. Like first, if anything is best represented numerically, then we don't need to visualize it, right? Because Visualization is for humans. I don't need a fancy graph if um, a machine can do a job for me, right? There is no point in ruining a perfectly good system by adding a human in the loop who looks at graphs and does stuff. So to, to start with a quote from that blog post is that anything that we can wrap in alerts or some threshold boundaries should kick off some automated process. And given that, we can think about like, what do we do with the rest, right? Maybe there are things that are too complicated or it's even impossible to create a heuristic or an alert threshold. Maybe we don't know, no, uh, we, we don't know enough about it yet. Maybe we don't even know what, what it actually is, right? So for all these kind of things, we do need a human in the loop and we do want some visualization to be happening. And, and that's one part of intuition engineering, right? The second thing is, this is what we do, right? We build, measure, learn, we automate all the things because we are smart people and, and we are doing the right thing, right? Aren't we? Um, and my point here is that automation reduces the impact of human error for that specific task because I don't have to type manual commands anymore. I can rely on a machine doing certain things. But automation does not mean that we don't need to understand why stuff is happening automatically, what automation is going to do in a certain situation. And I think this is the second point where intuition engineering can help us. So here's three points I'm trying to make in this presentation. Like first, measuring and alerting, that's all great, and I think all of us spend lots and lots of time uh, into that, and, and we do need it, but it's not enough. We do need intuition engineering for two kinds of things. First, understand our automation better, in which cases it behaves like what. And uh, second, to even like understand or learn about cases that we didn't think about even measuring or alerting about. 
And um, I'm trying to point out a way how to get there with some tools and some ways to operate. Um, and this is what I'm trying to achieve in this talk. Before we jump right into actual tooling and, and how to get there, um, I want to start with this man. Um, his name is Bernd Seeker. He is a systems engineer at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. And uh, his field of research is formal verification of safety critical systems. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, in reality, that means he does research and consulting for aviation systems. Um, so who of you took the plane to get here? Most of them, I, I, I guess so. And um, did you feel safe? Did you feel like the pilot knew what she was doing in like every situation? I, I, I certainly did so. I, I don't want to ruin your feelings for your flight back. So um, what, what Bernd um, did last year is he gave an interesting talk at the, at the end of last year at um, the German, like a conference based in Germany. The talk is in English uh, and it's linked here so, so you can actually watch it. I highly recommend it. That's called the role of automation dependency in aviation accidents. So the interesting part of that is uh, whenever something bad happens with an airplane, uh, people like him get called to figure out like, what it was that led to that accident and what could have been done to prevent that accident from happening. And one of the sources that he finds regularly is um, that pilots, heavily trained pilots, they have to undergo like many hours in a simulator, many, many hours in that specific airplane that they are uh, piloting in, they make the wrong assumptions about automation systems and their behavior in certain situations. And this is when bad stuff happens. Right? And, and that talk is quite fascinating on its own. So I very naively thought of an autopilot always like, it's a press of a button and then the airplane like does its thing and then you land and then that's it. Turns out it's a big set of different features and different automation things. One of them is automated thrust control, which makes the, the, the decision like in an automated way, should the airplane be accelerating or braking? And one of the examples that he is giving is that um, automated thrust control is implemented slightly differently in the two big aircraft manufacturers which is quite interesting if you happen to, for example, switch from an Airbus to a Boeing or vice versa, right? So, um, and rumor has it, and he mentions that in his talk, that there is one phrase that every pilot has uttered at least once in his career, and that is, what's it doing now? Right? So when unexpected things happen, my point is that you need, you need an intuitive understanding to react fast and appropriately. I mean, those people are dealing with, with human lives, and most of us are very lucky that our software systems are quite important, but not that important. Um, so I got two questions for you, and those two questions I also ask, ask myself, like, do I spend as many hours with my distributed system as pilots spend in their airplanes, even as preparation? And is my distributed system as thoroughly tested as software in an airplane, meaning like formally verified? Most likely no and no, right? But let's say even if it would be yes and yes, my point here is that his research shows that this is not enough. Bad things happen because you make the wrong assumptions about how automation behaves in certain cases. All right, so how do we get a better understanding of how automation behaves in certain cases? And um, this is the point I'm trying to make here. We need a tool to help us with that. Right? So we need to understand our complex system, get an intuition about it, and we need, therefore, we need a setup allowing us to practice, 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 reproduce certain situations, and so on. So Netflix uh, showed in 2015 as a glimpse of a tool they had internally called Flux back then. This is two pictures of a blog post taken from them. I'm going to explain in a second um, what, what, what they are about. So in the upper left corner, you see a broad overview, like the middle circle represents the internet, and the other three circles represent different availability zones where Netflix is installed in. 
And the dots between those things represent traffic. So this is from a situation where it happened that one of the availability zones started to fail. This is the lower one, right? And you see more dots connected to the other two AZs and less dots connected to, to the lower one. And you see a few dots flowing like from the lower AZ to the other AZs. That means they migrated customers during the failure from the, the failing AZ and moved them over to the other ones. So imagine you're in that situation. You realize, oh, one of Amazon's AZs is failing. And your expectation is, all right, we are fine because our automation will act in a certain way. It will move all customers from the existing AZ, like fr from the failing AZ, to the other two. And you can immediately have a look at a qualitative assessment of your network traffic. You're not actually interested in how many percent of your customers are still in that AZ and these kind of things. You want to have a confirmation that automation behaves in the way that you expect it to behave. And in the other picture, you can see a drill down in one of the AZs and see like how the individual microservices are communicating with, with, e with each other. And you can do like a similar assessment uh, on an like drill down level on that AZ. Um, then last year they finally open sourced it, and this was when I thought like I I, I want to have something for Bosch releases that is somehow comparable to whatever Netflix is having here. And this is when I started to to um, build up the stack. Um, I knew that I needed a network monitoring agent on all of the VMs that I'm installing. Um, that is packet beat here. I'm using a Bosch add-on, so we don't need any modifications to the Bosch releases we are trying to monitor. Uh, we need a database to actually store all the monitoring results. That is um, Elasticsearch in this case. You also get from Elastic a nice tool to query that database if you're in interested in more details. That is Kibana in this case. And of course, we have Visceral. This is a tool you just saw before on the slide from Netflix to visualize it in real time. I'm now showing you like two examples. One is a very small one. One is a bigger one to uh, see maybe the benefit and how it behaves in the real world. So the small example was like, almost the smallest one I could come up with, right? I, I built um, a very basic Bosch release that only provides a single HTTP endpoint um, called ping, and guess what it does? It returns a pop. So I installed three nodes of that release, and they are pinging each other. Um, I'm using Bosch links to connect all of these three nodes, so I don't have to deal with individual IP addresses here. And I thought, well, I can most likely predict what the network graph is going to look like, and, and this is what I came up with. So I got three ping apps here in a triangle. They are talking to each other, that's what I designed them to do. I got the director, the, the, the Bosch director, in the middle, and all of them are also talking to the Bosch director because they have a Bosch agent on them sending heartbeats to the director regularly. Okay. And all of this happens on OpenStack, and we are building the OpenStack CPI, so I knew that all OpenStack VMs talk to the OpenStack metadata service in our case. All right, sounds fair. However, when I looked at the actual graph at my first moment of what's it doing now, because even in that very small example, it looked like this. Uh, can you actually see the small lines between them? I hope so. Okay, so we got our triangle of, of ping apps over there. So far, so good. We got the director in the middle. All of them are talking to the director. That's great. We got the metadata service in the lower left corner. I also predicted that. And then we have three nodes I'm not so sure about. There is one in the lower right corner and two ones on the, in the upper right. Um, so that's when I, when I started to scratch my head and really uh, try to look into it um, in with, with Kibana, and I thought like, okay, um, let's query for those IP addresses, right? And, and see what kind of traffic we have. And we have like, every 15 minutes, we have requests which awfully look like DNS requests. Right? So packet beat cannot only record raw TCP flows, but also has some knowledge about individual protocols. DNS is one of them. And as you can see, like on the rightmost column, 
Uh, it queries for time host something 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 uh, dot sap. So this is our internal NTP server, right? I I remember configuring that. That makes sense. And I know that the Bosch stem cell actually does every 15 minutes sync its date using NTP date. All right, that's fair. So let's get back to this. That means in the lower right corner, that's a DNS server. And uh, in the upper right corner, these are the two NTP servers. All right, okay. So that means like even in the most ridiculous example, right, three nodes, just a single HTTP endpoint, I found like a few surprises, at least to me, um, to show like not everything's intuitively clear even if you don't have failures, like even in the regular operation mode, I found a few things that were interesting. All right, that's a small thing. We don't care about small things. I installed CF deployment, which is like the soon to be standard way to install CF. Um, and it comes like, this is an entire Cloud Foundry installation, right? It comes with two and for some instances, even three AZs. I installed a single application um, and just curled it and um, wanted to see what's happening. But to make it more interesting, let's add some turbulence. Right? So if you don't know the turbulence release done by Dimitri, the PM of Bosch, you should totally check it out. It's basically Bosch's chaos monkey. Uh, you can kill individual nodes, you can shut down entire AZs, you can fill up disks, you can block network traffic, you can do anything you like. And, um, my intention was to shut down an entire availability zone and see what happens, right? I got a few assumptions, right? When an entire AZ fails, that shouldn't be an issue. I can still access my application. I can still work with the API of Cloud Foundry. I can still push, I can still ask for the status. And eventually, Bosch will repair everything, right? It will, it will bring it back and all is well afterwards. So I did kill an entire AZ. And um, I had my second moment of uh, what's happening now or what's it doing now because I learned that in CF deployment, they're using MySQL. And MySQL is installed as a singleton in, in AZ1. So when I shut down AZ1 entirely, um, the answers were, I can still access my app? Nope. I can work with the API? Nope. Did Bosch bring it back? Yeah. And then it worked. So, all right, let's be fair and not shut down actually MySQL, but pr let's pretend in this, in, in, in this case we're using some kind of cluster DB that RES manages or whatever. Um, all right, I'm scared of live demos, so here's the video for you. I recorded it up front. Um, before we start, this is what Cloud Foundry looks like when you record the network traffic. Um, it's hard to make sense of all of it, but let's, let's try it together. Um, so here is my, my jump box from which I'm on the, on the left corner from which I'm doing the requests. I got huge requests going on to the Diego cells um, and, and to the routers. And then on the right-hand side, that's the cell. On the right-hand side, the IP address, that's my application. So that makes sense, right? I got a huge flow of, of traffic from the jump box where I'm using curl to the application. There's also lots of other things going on with etcd, who is the primary source of communication as well uh, in CF release, um, and a few other things are happening. So I'm moving the etcd node up there and um, then trying to kill a few things. All right, so here that's turbulence and that's the JSON description of, st of stuff I'm going to shut down. And you can see like everything is in Z1 and it's executing a, till, a, a kill task right there. So Bosch instances is showing or starting to show a few instances as failing. Um, and as we get back to the actual visual, visual, visualization, well, hard word, um, you can see a few nodes disappearing. Um, and we can probably see a few other things that we um, can even see better when we turn on network filtering that we will do in a second. Uh, API nodes still getting lots of traffic, so the curl still works. You can still see network traffic going to my application. Um, right. All right. Um, visceral 
because this is an awful lot of traffic happening, has the ability to uh, filter by network traffic um, occurrence, so to say. Like you can only filter out the stuff where lots of network traffic is filtering, uh, is, is happening. So let's do that for a second. You can see here two primary sources of traffic. One is still routing to my app. The other one is interesting. This is two etcd nodes talking to one IP address there in the, in the uh, lower right corner, right? So I was interested very much in that and um, was trying to figure out what happened because in the regular mode of operation, you don't really see that happening, right? Etcd behaves very nicely and doesn't talk to, to any other nodes. When you turn back the filtering, like back to, to um, or include more and more TCP, TCP flows, you can see that other primary sources of network traffic are, as expected, um, Doppler, so everybody is still logging files, and so on. Um, so what is it that, that etcd was actually doing there? Um, when I fired up Kibana and uh, did a few uh, queries for the network traffic for that IP address, I realized that this IP address I had seen before, like in my, in my previous very small example. That's my DNS server. So both etcd nodes were firing like 60 DNS requests per second in order to find their third etcd node, the one I shut down. But why is my infrastructure DNS server being asked for CF internal domains? Console is supposed, is supposed to do all of that. And, and I don't know if you attended Nima's and um, Adrian's talk about why getting rid of console is a good idea. Um, I didn't have the time to, to look into uh, that, um, that high amount of DNS queries, but I imagine that in this case, for some reason, console doesn't actually give the right answer in time or even at all. And that's why the next DNS server in my resource conf, which is my infrastructure DNS server, is queried quite a lot here. Fortunately, the application was still uh, working and alive, so I could still work with it, but this is still an interesting thing to happen. And depending on what kind of infrastructure you're using, how big your installation is, and um, what kind of traffic you're ex ex expecting, things like this can already be um, quite a problem in your inf infrastructure. Okay, so let's get back for a second to my assumptions uh, that I had in the beginning. Turns out um, I can still access my app as long as my database is still running. Same applies for the API. Bosch brings it back. It takes quite a long time uh, for the resurrector to bring up the entire AZ. Um, and all is well afterwards. That's cool. So, um, all right. As a summary, um, I tried to show that measuring and alerting alone is, is not enough to really understand your uh, complex distributed system and that we need some kind of intuition engineering to really figure out what's going on either in failure cases or even like in regular cases to really understand what's going on. Tooling and practice are like the most important things here. So you need some kind of chaos monkey. You need to be able to do that in production uh, in order to really learn and get the most out of it. And please rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, do it. All right, if you'd like to follow up, uh, all of this is on GitHub. Um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, Slack, or right here at the conference. I'm still around. And um, that is pretty much it. P.S. We are hiring. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? We still got time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you talked about, you know, formal methods, uh, basically, on, you know, visual analysis uh, in, uh, in the model checking method. Uh, do you, um, because it's often quite used in academic uh, fields, but apart from real-time systems, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, not so often in IT, basically, it was a person method, but you maybe have to find history, I don't know. And what, what is the first thing that you have just figured out how to tools that have uh, Bosch uh, hops to visualize? Can you uh, give your thought about something that you could help them to understand or to put proper keys uh, on the links between your uh, nodes in the graph, basically? Or is it something that you uh, 
Okay, to understand the question, um, I think what you're asking is if I try to annotate the network links with some more metadata to, to, to get some more information about that? Yes, uh, because as part of your hopes uh, in the work, you have to figure out and to summarize a little, you know, the uh, behavior between the, the nodes. So did you try to determine that? Um, I didn't check it out in detail. So visceral, uh, I mean, what we saw as, as the, visual, as the visual, blah, blah, visualization, Thanks. Um, is actually just nodes and edges. Uh, the whole um, the whole application allows you to also display like a details panel about I don't know how many uh, requests were successful, how many of them failed, or annotated with any metadata that you feel fit. So you can you can of course do this. Um, I didn't do that in in detail. Other questions? Sure. So we such an uh, implementation that the performance impact will prevent um, them from being um, instantiated in production? Is there a performance impact that prevents it from running in production? Um, sure. So there is a performance impact depending on what kind of method you're using for capturing packages, and there is a number of them. Um, most of them don't use kernel primitives to record network traffic. Uh, you can switch, if you're installing a kernel module, um, you can switch to uh, PFRing, which is uh, using, for example, zero copy to actually um, get a copy of the, the packages, so the overhead is practically zero. However, if you want to use PFRing for zero copy mode, uh, that will cost you a quite amount of money. So in this case, what I'm using here, it is imposing quite some um, performance issues or like performance overhead um, that you need to consider. So for us, we are going to run this on our performance test landscapes to figure out what the actual overhead like is in terms of throughput and so on, and um, then make a few decisions. So the question is um, that the reason why I'm seeing the DNS requests is because the application domain needs to be resolved. Um, I don't think so. So when I looked into the actual DNS requests that happened, it was um, the etcd cluster that tried to find its third node. Um, and um, apparently it's consul not appropriately responding with the right with the right answer or even responding at all. So that's why the infrastructure DNS was queried for the third etcd node that was actually down. I think we got room for one more question. All right, no questions. I'm still around, feel free to reach out. Um, thanks again. <laughs>